going into that going into that uh, that part right there, he had actually just hurt um, Poirier and kind of got him a little bit wobbly, and he was going in for the kill and then kind of applied pressure. Poirier was doing well. Um, hit him with a couple of knees that were legal, and then he fell down to the ground and hit him with a third knee, uh, which when the fight was immediately stopped. But it looked like Alvarez might be, at, at the very least, he was going to win that round by a long shot, and he might be able to finish the fight in that round. I believe he won the first round as well. Poirier, you know, different people think different things. I heard Poirier say that he thought he won the first round. I would have given the first round to Alvarez. Um, but that was a great fight. Uh, since then, they've both had victories um, over Justin Gaethje, for example. A- Eddie Alvarez, his next fight was a third-round knockout of Justin Gaethje. That was in December of last year. Poirier's had two fights since then. One of them was in uh, November of last year, and that was a fight of the night, third-round third TKO over Anthony Pettis. And then he came back in April of this year, fought Justin Gaethje as well, fourth-round TKO uh, in a was that performance of the night, fight of the night on that one as well. Doing MMA math is obviously tough. You know what I mean? It's it's difficult to put things together. Uh, like I said, I thought that Alvarez was probably controlling the fight slightly in 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 the Poirier fight. I mean, he was at least going to go up two rounds to zero. Um, and I think that he also looked a little bit better against Justin Gaethje than did Poirier. Like I, both of them got the knockout. Poirier's in the fourth round. Alvarez is in the third round. And both of them had trouble with Gaethje too. Uh, it wasn't super. Uh, it wasn't easy for for either of them. Both of them sustained a lot of damage in those fights. Uh, yeah, Al- Alvarez, I think probably. Well, his, his fight at least he was a little bit more on the attack. Gaethje had Poirier on, on the retreat the entire four rounds, and Poirier just hit him with a with a really nice straight left, um, and ended up knocking him out pretty much immediately after that. But he was probably down three rounds to zero. Going in, maybe, maybe two to one. I mean, some people think the Poirier might have won the first round against Gaethje, but I think he was probably down three rounds to zero, whereas Alvarez was probably one round to one round against Gaethje when he got the knockout. You know, not that MMA math necessarily works, but Alvarez, in my opinion, has looked better, a little bit better later, more recently. Um, break down their backgrounds here. 29-5-1 and one record for Alvarez. The one is obviously the no contest for the illegal knee. Uh, five, two, and one in the UFC. Sixteen knockouts, seven submissions. Been the champion of multiple organizations. Five foot ten, sixty-nine inch inch reach. Uh, brown belt in jiu-jitsu under Ricardo Almeida, with Ricardo Almeida MMA. Mark Henry fighting out of New York. There. Uh, the other side, Poirier, twenty-three, five, and one. Very similar record. Six less uh, victories than one is obviously the no contest. Twelve knockouts, six submissions. Um, pretty similar there also. 15-4-1 and one in the UFC. A lot of fights there for him. 20 fights in the UFC. So that's a definitely good for him, I think. He's a little bit weathered, but he's also got a ton of experience. 5'9", 72-inch reach. Uh, it's pretty weird because when they were standing next to each other, I thought that Poirier looked taller. But, you know, you can say whatever you want. Uh, black belt in jiu-jitsu, he is. And he's fighting again out of Coconut Creek, Florida with American Top Team. All right, let me open up the trusty Samsung here, and let's figure out what the odds are on this fight. Oh, all right, a little bit surprised. Uh, Dustin Poirier, minus 165. Eddie Alvarez, plus 135 on this one. So a not a big favorite, but a decent-sized favorite for Dustin Poirier here against Eddie Alvarez. Uh, the one advantage, in my opinion, that I see that Poirier has is he's got the straight left. He's a southpaw fighter, and he's got really seemingly long arms, or at least his reach, like his the reach that he commands, whether or not his arms are actually long. He has great reach. Um, that's how he knocked out Gaethje. He was on the retreat, on the retreat, and just threw this lanky left hand uh, right up the middle, dapped him on the chin, and ended up hurting him. Um, that's exactly the same thing that happened to Eddie Alvarez by Conor McGregor. The exact same thing. Southpaw, uh, long, long arms, um, power. So if, if if there's any correlation at all or anything that I like about Poirier's game over Alvarez, it's going to be the and, – and I mean, there's other things. He's got great boxing skills. His combinations are very good. They're less predictable than Alvarez's. Not nearly as powerful. Al- Alvarez brings crazy intensity with his punches, uh, especially his hooks. 
and uppercuts. Um, but Poirier's jabs, his traditional boxing, his straight left, like I said, are fantastic. And he's got a lot of power in the straight left. That's the best thing that's going on for Poirier there. On the other side, Eddie Alvarez is the power advantage overall. Poirier doesn't really want to get involved in a back and forth with Eddie Alvarez. He's probably going to get knocked out. He, that's usually what happens with people that do go get into a back and forth. Whether you're thinking about Dos Anjos, whether you're thinking about Gaethje, um, or even Poirier before. like He was probably losing that fight, like I said. So, Eddie Alvarez, he looked fantastic going to the body against Justin Gaethje. I think that's going to be a, you know, if he gets in uh, and he sees Poirier protecting the head a little bit, I think he's going to try to eat the body up a little bit. And he also looked really good uh, in the third round of the Gaethje fight. Gaethje, one of the best leg kickers in MMA. Uh, Eddie Alvarez was taking it out of his game plan and giving him some leg kicks that looked really good in the third round that kind of possibly would have led uh, to that knockout. I think that he's going to be able to use that to try to slow down the movement of Dustin Poirier. Poirier is going to really have to be careful and precise and really pick his shots to win this fight. I'm going to go ahead and take the underdog here, and I think this is probably the best fight as far as the money is concerned on the card. Uh, either this or the Joanna and Jacek fight. But I think this is going to be a – I'm going to take a second-round knockout victory for Eddie Alvarez in the second fight between him and Dustin Poirier. You put that shit in the books. All righty, this brings us to the end of the show for the most part, or at least the end of the breakdown. Figured I'll give you some MMA news here before um, – before I end up leaving, there's some big things that would have happened. I'm going to do a little uh, on every podcast after every breakdown. I'll give you maybe five minutes or so of some MMA news, of what has happened in the week here. Uh, obviously, the biggest news, I guess, is news that came out today. Today, Conor McGregor was in court uh, in New York City for the whole dolly throwing incident, at whatever it was, UFC 223 or whatever it was, um, where Kiesa got hurt and Rose Nama Yunus got hurt. Uh, he basically pled guilty to a lesser charge. He's going to be getting no felonies, no jail time, and actually no criminal record as, as well. He will have to pay restitution, apparently. Uh, five days of community service, whatever that means. And I think he has to take three days or something like that of some sort of anger management or decision management class, and he's going to be getting out on that one. Obviously... A big deal. He could be going to prison. They treat people relatively harsh for uh, violent felonies in New York. It's not that you know, not that surprising. Obviously, him also you know being who he is and having the pull of the Fertitas and all of uh, you know Dana White and many other people. Obviously, I would imagine swayed things a little bit. Probably combine that with the fact he doesn't really have a criminal record otherwise that I'm aware of. I don't think he has any. Uh, but yeah, Conor McGregor, I guess, is going to be. Available to be back in the octagon relatively soon. People are talking about an October 6th matchup for the lightweight title between him and Khabib Nurmagomedov. Uh, shit, let's make it happen. I think it'll be awesome if that if that does go down. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Another title news. Uh, after fighting, what, six weeks ago or something like that, five weeks ago, Colby Covington, because of his nose surgery, is going to be stripped of his interim title for, what, interim... 170-pound welterweight title. Um, and even though he wouldn't have been able to be medically cleared anyway uh, to fight Tyron Woodley in September, which is going to happen, I believe, UFC 226 or something like that, uh, they wanted to make that happen, but he wouldn't have even been medically cleared anyway. They're going to strip him of his interim title and for the undisputed uh, welterweight title, UFC welterweight title, in September, we're going to have uh, Darren Till stepping up to fight Tyron Woodley. That's going to be a fantastic fight. Till, obviously, not afraid of damage. Had a pretty pretty good-looking victory over Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in his last outing. Obviously, it's uh, you know two victories over, or a victory and a draw over uh, Wonderboy for Tyron Woodley. So I think this is going to be a fantastic matchup. I'm, I'm interested to see if Woodley goes back and uses some more of his wrestling to cut, try to take away a little bit of the striking, what I perceive as a striking advantage for Darren Till. Um, maybe other people don't, but I also see a bit of a size advantage as far as height and everything like that. Not as, not as strong, obviously, but a little bit of a height 
and striking advantage for Till. So I think that's actually going to be a really interesting fight, probably more interesting than uh, Covington versus versus Woodley would have been. I just think it's a little bit cheesy that they're you know taking the bell from the guy. In other news, I guess what Cormier Cormier is looking for a fight at 205. He wants to defend his championship at 205 later this year. Uh, he's hoping in maybe November or December, and then possibly uh, he would like to defend after that, if everything goes well. He would like to defend his heavyweight championship in uh, February or March, and then right off into the sunset. He said that's his plan. He'll fight no later than March. He will retire in March, and he's hoping to get two more fights in his in his uh, uh, career. He did say 100% sure, though, his next fight will be for the 205-pound light heavyweight championship. So um, right now the Brock Lesnar is on hold or all these other things are on hold, and there's not really anybody who is in the forefront um, or or is a a front runner, honestly, to get that fight. So somebody's going to really have to make a difference between now and probably about two months from now in order to get that fight. But that will be next for Daniel Cormier. We are just a few days, I guess, uh, what, like a week or two away from uh, UFC 227. That'll be the one right after this. Man, I can't wait for that breakdown. Uh, the rematch of Dillashaw versus Garbrandt. Super excited. Everybody think about that. That's going to be fun. Uh, what else is going on in the UFC right now? Uh, Alex Munoz is the victory of the Dana White what, Tuesday Night Contender Series or whatever. Yeah, Tuesday Night Contender Series. Uh, in the main event, he gets the victory over Nick Newell who is the one-armed MMA guy who everybody's really enjoying right now and everybody pulling for. Uh, Three-round unanimous victory for uh, Alex Munoz on that one. I suppose that's, uh, and I'm pretty sure that he uh, and Newell are both going to get contracts to the UFC. I didn't really see one one way or the other if they did, but uh, that's good news for them, I suppose. Uh, they announced about for Madison Square Garden card November 30th at UFC 230. We're going to have number one, uh, contender, Yoel Romero, taking on Paulo Costa, or Paulo Coutinho, or whatever his name is. Uh, or is that Boracina? Eh, I can't remember. But Paulo Costa, essentially, number eight guy, b- badass knockout last week. Uh, but that's going to be an awesome fight there. Romero versus Costa, that's been announced, like I said there, for a Madison, Madison Square Garden card. Eh... Also on that Madison Square Garden card, we are looking at a... Another middleweight uh, bout between two possible contenders here. Number five, Jacques Aré versus number seven, David Branch. Uh, that'll be a pretty damn good fight there. I like both of those fighters quite a bit. David Branch gets a lot of hate, but I like him. Um, shit, what else we got here? Shout out to Anthony Smith for the uh, knockout victory over Shogun Hua last week. That was fantastic. Uh, back-to-back. Knockouts of X light heavyweight champions in, I believe, a two month period. So, definitely a shout out to Anthony Smith. We'll see what's coming up later with him. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's pretty much going to be the end of where we're at here. Uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and call this one a wrap here. All right, this is going to be the end of episode 52 UFC on Fox, Alvarez versus Poirier Part 2. I hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, I'll see you next week. That's not as always, but I will see you next week. And as always, I love you.